The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, a chilling dream. I came upon this accident scene. That came true just two months later. They pretty much told us she was probably not going to make it. We conclude our week of prayer. I turned around and there was Jesus. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. The leaders of North and South Korea came together at their border for an historic summit today. They say they want to remove nuclear weapons from the Korean Peninsula, although they didn't say how they'll get that done. Well, they also reached other agreements in an effort to ease tensions between their countries. Jennifer Wishon brings us this look at the scene as the two leaders came together. A most extraordinary scene. The dictator from the north alongside the democratically elected president from the south, parading through pomp as the world watched. Kim Jong-un crossed the world's most heavily armed border. The first North Korean leader to do so since the Korean War, amid cheers, warmly greeting Moon Jae-in. He then invited Moon to step into the north. The north and south are still technically at war, but the leaders behave like old friends. <laughs> For Moon, it's the fulfillment of a major political goal to improve relations with the North. His challenge is getting Kim to get specific about how much he's willing to reduce his nuclear arms. The Korean summit lays the foundation for the planned historic meeting between Kim and President Trump that could come next month. This on the heels of now Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's visit to the North earlier this month. Newly released photos show him meeting with Kim, and it appears President Trump says that the dictator is behaving like an honest broker. He really has been uh, very open and I think very honorable from everything we're seeing. We have been told uh, directly that they would like to have the meeting as soon as possible, and we think that's a great thing for the world. Kim hopes to use his nuclear might and the legitimacy that will come with having a meeting with the president of the United States to forge a peace treaty with the South that ends the Korean War and pushes the 30,000 U.S. forces stationed in the South off the Korean Peninsula. However, it's unlikely the U.S. would leave. In time, Kim envisions a unified Korea led by the North that's beholden neither to the U.S. nor China. But skeptics suggest Kim is only dangling disarmament to buy more time and ease tough U.S. sanctions to perfect its nuclear weapons while still collecting international aid. Maybe it'll be wonderful and maybe it won't. And if it's not going to be fair and reasonable and good, uh, I will, unlike past administrations, I will leave the table. In a note, Kim wrote, a new history begins now at the starting point of history and the era of peace. Time will tell. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Well, it's an historic day. Um, technically, the U.S. and South Korea are still at war with North Korea. Uh, there's only an armistice agreement. Uh, the North has never... Uh, wanted to have peace. Uh, they wanted to stay in a state of war. Uh, so this is an historic day. It's an historic day where the two leaders cross that border uh, and visit one another. So there's a lot of hope here. I know it's been in many people's prayers for decades. Can North and South Korea unify again? Can there be peace on the Korean Peninsula? Uh, so let's be hopeful. Um, yes, we need to to verify things, we need to negotiate wisely. But at the same time, let's be hopeful because peace there would be a wonderful thing. In other news, once again, Israel is facing criticism from the United Nations. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights says Israel is using excessive force against Palestinians who've been staging mass protests led by Hamas for the last month along the Gaza border with Israel. 
Zaid Rayed Al Hussein says Israel hasn't listened to warnings by the UN and others after Israeli troops have used lethal force against protesters. The Israeli army has dropped leaflets close to the Gaza border, warning Palestinians to stay away from the border fence during the protest and telling them they endangered their lives if they followed Hamas directives. Israel says Hamas is using the protest as cover for attacks. Tennessee lawmakers have voted to build a monument to unborn children in memory of the victims of abortion. The monument would stand on the grounds of the state capitol in Nashville. It would be inscribed, Tennessee Monument to Unborn Children, in memory of the victims of abortion, babies, women, and men. The monument would be paid for by private funds. The Republican-led Senate passed the bill for the monument this week by a vote of 23 to 3. Lawmakers need to agree on an amendment before sending the measure to Governor Bill Haslam, who's a Republican, so it now goes back to the House, which already approved it last week by a vote of 63 to 15. Christian ministries have sometimes been called streams of God. A number of them are coming together because they believe their unity could help to set off history's greatest revival. Paul Strand brings us that story from a major gathering of these ministry streams in Toronto, Canada. Toronto is seeing some of the flames reigniting that burned so powerfully during the Toronto Blessing Revival that started in 1994 and touched millions around the world. It's a gathering of some of the most powerful streams of ministry that have been used in revival across the past three decades. They've gathered in Toronto because all believe God wants to light the fire again and hit the world with possibly the greatest awakening and harvest of all time. Daniel Kalinda is the successor of Reinhard Bonnke, whose Christ for All Nations says it has seen more than 70 million salvations. He says Christians need to focus on Jesus himself. It actually makes our jobs quite easy. We just present Jesus to people and the Holy Spirit comes in and does the rest. Lou Engel has been leading intercessors crying out for this for more than 30 years. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh, I'm taking away the sins that are, I'm believing for a mass beholding of the Lamb of God. So many people getting saved and secondly, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John Kilpatrick's church was the headquarters for the Brownsville revival that began in 1995. He says he heard about this much larger revival that was yet to come the day Al-Qaeda brought down the Twin Towers. I watched the towers came come down and I, I said to the Lord, I said, well, Lord, does this mean that revival's over? And the Lord responded to me immediately. He said, oh, no. He said, revival's not over. He said, I'm going to pour out my spirit again, but it'll be in conjunction with end time events. Rick Joyner of Morningstar Ministries believes it's crucial that all of these various streams of ministry work in unison. Because there is a multiplication of authority and spiritual authority when you come together. One can put a thousand to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight. He believes it's the best kind of witness to a fragmenting world. They're starting to love each other, come together, have unity, have peace, have joy. All these things that the world is becoming increasingly devoid of. I do believe in a billion soul harvest that's been prophesied about. Global Awakenings Randy Clark was preaching here when the Toronto Blessing began in the 1990s. He points out some have said this will be a faceless, nameless revival because God wants to use every willing person in the entire church, not just evangelical superstars. Uh, and it didn't mean that there weren't leaders, but it meant that the leaders understood their role was to release the, the others, the laity. Engel called the crowd in Toronto to become those disciples, asking them to take off their shoes and say, God send me. How beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. How shall they hear unless there's a preacher? He's just looking for people that are hungry and open and will say, God, whatever you want to do, here am I. Paul Strand, CBN News at the Light the Fire Again conference in Toronto. Come on, just release. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Gordon. Uh, let's bring the good news and, and let's bring it around the world. Um, I believe that this is the greatest in-gathering in the history of the church. What the Apostle Paul talked about, the final in-gathering of the Gentiles. Uh, and let's not just look at North America. Let's not just look at Europe. Let's look at the Middle East. Let's look at India. Let's look at China. Let's look at all the stands all those wonderful countries, the wonderful people, realizing that God died for them, and let's bring them the good news. Terry? Well, coming up five years after leaving the Senate, Joe Lieberman gives his take on politics today.
I'm afraid the parties are increasingly becoming sort of homogenous in terms of opinions, and they're getting to be like warring tribes. Find out what Senator Lieberman misses about Washington and what he's been doing since he's retired after this. Well, during his years in Washington, Senator Joe Lieberman earned a reputation as a maverick. He charted his own political path. And now in retirement, CBN News has learned that hasn't changed. Recently, he sat down with our John Jessup to discuss President Trump, partisan politics, and our rich heritage of faith. It's been five years since Joe Lieberman left the Senate, a lifelong Democrat who won his final re-election as an independent after losing to a left-leaning primary challenger. Do you think there's room for people like Joe Lieberman in the Democratic Party today? Well, I worry about it, and I'm afraid the parties are increasingly becoming sort of homogenous in terms of opinions, and they're getting to be like warring tribes. I think that's a big part of why uh, President Trump got elected, because he was from outside. Still, Lieberman believes the November midterms favored the Democratic Party, but he also told CBN News they shouldn't be too confident. All they got to do is go back about a year and a half to 2016, and of course, Democrats, most Democrats felt there was absolutely no chance that Donald Trump would be elected president, but here he was. Although he endorsed Hillary Clinton, Lieberman supports President Trump on a number of issues, like his tough stance on Iran. He even introduced one of the more controversial cabinet nominees to his former Senate colleagues. In turn, President Trump considered him as a replacement for FBI Director James Comey until Lieberman bowed out of the running. A lot of observers describe his, his tenure so far as tumultuous. It may be that uh, that's just the way he, he is and that's the way his administration will be. I must say myself, overall, that uh, I agree with some things and I disagree with others. I probably agree with him generally on foreign policy. I think he's brought some strength back to our uh, foreign policy. But th the truth is that I wish the president would tweet a little less, uh, a name call on his, some of the people against him a little less, and just focus on, on policy and really use his skill as a negotiator to find common ground. Common ground is familiar territory for him. Once Democrat Al Gore's running mate, he would later cross the aisle to support the Iraq war and become close friends with several in the GOP. During your time in the Senate, you had uh, very unique friendships with Lindsey Graham and Senator John McCain. They were great friends. Uh, the, the, uh, people ask me, do you miss the Senate, well, sometimes, but it usually passes quickly, but I miss my friends. Uh, John has a serious cancer, but he's, he's fighting it. From everything I know, the treatment is succeeding, but, but it, for now, um, it, it limits him. So I, I, hope, I pray for him every day. Washington needs John McCain, whether you agree with him or disagree with him on every issue. He's a, he's a real patriot and speaks his mind and is willing to work across party lines. Lieberman's latest venture is a new book about his love of the law, both God's law as an Orthodox Jew and the rule of law as a former prosecutor. The book is about um, the Ten Commandments, really. And it's about the centrality of God's giving of the Ten Commandments, not only to our faith, particularly Christianity and Judaism, but to our vision of what the law is. The exodus from Egypt, God's liberation of the children of Israel from Egypt was only the beginning of the story. Um, uh, it wasn't all about freedom alone because freedom alone is not enough. Freedom without law, without values, particularly that God gave us in the Ten Commandments, that kind of freedom without law probably leads to injustice, immorality, violence, chaos, so we, we, the, the end of the exodus and the liberation was the revelation. And as for division in America, he says, look no further than the people of the book to find examples where unity prevails. I think it's interesting that you just mentioned Judaism and Christianity. These yes. are two groups that haven't always been closely associated. Well, I really appreciate what you've said, John, because I believe that as I look back at my life, what are some of the great uh, changes for the better that I've uh, uh, seen. One, uh, one of them is the coming together of Judaism and Christianity. There was always this strain 
within um, uh, Christianity of a love of the Hebrew Bible and a love of Israel. It was there in the founding generation of uh, Americans, and a lot of that is reflected in the values that were expressed in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So why this has happened now, I, I don't know, but I'm very grateful. Well, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. John uh, Jessup, so CBN really News, discussion. Washington. Well, Senator Joe Lieberman, one of the great patriots and wonderful wisdom to acknowledge that, yes, uh, morality is at the root of all liberty. Uh, and our Constitution, our Republic, unless it's based on that morality, uh, we don't have much chance of surviving. So wonderful w words. And yes, Christians and Jews are coming together. Uh, we're, we're becoming uh, one, if you will. Uh, and again, that's fulfillment of what the Apostle Paul predicted, that there would be one day, one new man. We've got a movie for you if you want to know more about what Israel is doing, what, what's driving them. It's called To Life, and it highlights all the humanitarian work is Israeli, Israelis are doing, whether it's Israeli NGOs or even the IDF. Uh, you may not know the IDF goes on medical missions around the world, whether it's to Nepal or to Haiti. And in this movie, you'll learn what drives them. And it, for me, it was a real surprise. I thought I knew a lot about Israel. My first trip was back in 1969. Uh, so I, I thought I knew a whole lot. But in producing this movie, I learned something new. They self-identify with a prophecy from Isaiah. It's, find it in chapter 49, verse 6, where God says, I will make you a light to the nations. And so you'll hear firsthand from the volunteers doing humanitarian work in remote places, uh, helping Syrian refugees, helping victims of hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, providing solar water power to Uganda. Uh, you'll hear them all say, I'm doing this because I'm a light to the nations. Uh, and I find that wonderful. And in watching this, producing it, I started holding up a mirror to America uh, when's the last time you heard an American say, we're supposed to be a city on a hill. We're supposed to be a light to the nations. So get this. It's available for you. You can watch it online or you can uh, own the DVD for a gift of $10 or more. All you have to do is call us. 1-800-707-1000. And my hope is this DVD will encourage people and encourage nations around the world. Uh, well, what can we do to be a light to the nations? It really spoke to me as a believer. It's a great challenge, you know, to be unified and to say, you know, God has placed us here for such a time yeah. as this. Yes. Well, get your copy. You don't want to miss it. Well, up next, doctors have a grim report for the sister of a woman whose car was crushed under a semi. They pretty much told us she had, you know, we had no hope that she was probably not going to make it. There was no brain activity. Um, they kept her on life support to harvest her organs. See how this woman on life support stepped into heaven and then made a miraculous recovery back here on earth. Plus, we're going to be praying for you and your requests, so stay with us. All this week, our CBN staff has been gathering in the Regent University Chapel at noon as part of our spring week of prayer. And we've been praying for the requests of you, our partners and viewers. Well, yesterday, Pat Robertson was our featured speaker. Take a look. What is our obligation? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength? That's the number one commandment. God says this, because you have set your love on me, therefore I will. I will rescue him. I will protect him. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, folks, that's the reward of loving God. 
We've had wonderful messages all week long. You can join us today for chapel. If you'd like to, just log on to CBN.com at noon Eastern time when we'll be streaming the service live. Today's featured speaker is best-selling author Mo Isom. We'll also be talking with Mo later on today's show, so you don't want to miss that either. Gord? Well, doctors had given up all hope for Valerie. She was on life support with no brain activity. But Valerie's sister refused to believe the doctor's report. Instead, she relied on a scripture for her sister's healing, and she also believed that the possible was possible against all odds. In the dream, I was driving in my car, and I came upon this accident scene that had to do with semi-trucks. And so when I started waking up out of the dream, I was like, I could feel it was a dream from the Lord, and I felt burdened. And so I began to pray right away. March of 2000. Two months after Cheryl Schulke's dramatic dream, her sister Valerie Paters was in a freeway pileup near her home in Flagstaff, Arizona. Valerie's car was crushed under the weight of a semi-truck, and it took first responders several hours to extract her from the vehicle. A mutual friend was on the scene and got word to Cheryl that Valerie was unconscious and not expected to survive. We hung up the phone, and the minute we hung up, I started praying. I said, God, how do you want me to pray for Valerie? And he said, pray that she will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Those words from Psalm 118, verse 17, gave Cheryl hope as she prayed for her sister's life. It stirred my faith to believe that the impossible was possible already before I even saw her. So when I did see her, I was not moved by what I saw in the hospital because I didn't even recognize her. But what moved me was the Word of God. A prayer chain quickly started as word spread through their church community. But when Cheryl got to the hospital, doctors gave her a grim report. They pretty much told us she had, you know, we had no hope that she was probably not going to make it. There was no brain activity. Um, they kept her on life support to harvest her organs. Cheryl would not give up. She gathered friends and continued praying for Valerie to wake from her coma. I want those that I have already prayed with or one in spirit that will believe God's word and we're gonna go to war and we're gonna pray over Valerie. And so we took a time one day, I think it was on a Wednesday, we went into the chapel and we took over the chapel and the chapel became like a war room. We went in there and we just began to speak life over her. We prayed over her. Their prayers continued for days, but there were no visible signs of improvement. Meanwhile, Valerie was experiencing a very different reality in heaven. When I stepped into heaven, I mean, I, I hit the light and I was literally blinded by the light. I'm blinded still today of the light of his presence. I stood up, I turned around, and there was Jesus. And I don't know if I, I ran to him or he came to me. I mean, all of a sudden we were there. He just smiled at me and I felt all this emotion that he had for me. I finally felt like I, I was home. It was like I stepped into Finally, I belonged. This is where I belonged. This, I was home. Valerie had been a Christian for most of her life, but says she never believed that God really loved her. In my heart of hearts, I did not believe that I was worthy of His love. Because I always felt like I was never going to measure up to what I thought the Lord wanted from me. So when I felt His emotion, I felt how He felt about me, and the things that I, I thought about myself, like my flaws or my, my issues, he never even noticed. He just wants me. It wasn't anything that I, I did for him. It wasn't my performance, nothing. It was, it was just me. I wasn't just loved by him, but he was in love with me. And I was his, I, that was it. I was done for, <laughs> and I, I thought, ah. but then realizing this is how he feels about his creation, those that he's created, whether they know him yet or not, this is how he feels. 
Valerie says she felt like she was there for a thousand years and experienced life and love like she never had on earth. Then, Jesus told her she had to go back with a message. He said, you can stay if you want to. And I said, well, if I can stay, I'm staying with you. I'm going to stay with you. And he said, but your purpose isn't done. And he said, I want you to tell them, tell the people who I am, who I really am. Because I thought he was, you know, religious. I thought he was mean. I thought he was, um, I didn't think he was, you know, human. And he, he's human, he'll always be human, but he's God. I didn't want to leave him. I hated leaving, but I had to come back. And the next thing I knew, I was making like my descent back to the earth. At the hospital days after the accident, the medical team began reacting to new signs of life. And the doctor's checking, he's flashing the light in her eyes, and, and he, he looks at me and he said, Get ready, I think your sister's coming back. I see some brain activity. I, I just began to rejoice, rejoice, and I said, thank you, Lord. Valerie soon woke up and experienced a miraculous recovery. Two and a half months after the accident, she walked out of the hospital, healed both physically and spiritually. I, I know who I really am. And so when I had to deal with, you know, coming back with the suffering, um, my, my time with the Lord is what carried me through my recovery. While Valerie was in heaven getting a revelation of the love of Jesus, I was on earth getting a revelation of the love of Jesus. There's a love that I've been experiencing, of Jesus' love that I'd never experienced before as a Christian. Cheryl and Valerie look back on their experience amazed and thankful for the answered prayers and love they each received in their time of need. I was worth the price they paid. That blew me away. We are worth the price that he paid for us. It was the power of prayer to see God bring forth a miracle. Believe the word of the Lord, stand on his word, get a scripture and stand on that word. And, and continue to pray, no matter how bad it looks. Even when the doctors give you the bad report, believe in the report of the Lord, which is a good report, and stand in faith believing for your miracle. And I know God will give them a miracle. What a wonderful story. Here's a thought for you. You can never be too dead for a resurrection. And here's Valerie, brain dead. The doctor saying, well, we're keeping her on life support uh, because we want to harvest her organ. She's an organ donor. Um, and, and there's no brain activity. But to believe through all of that, and then, you know, Valerie come forth, and, and not just come forth back into life, but to completely recover uh, with no brain injury, uh, no lingering effects from the uh, accident. What a wonderful thing. We serve a wonderful God. And the wonderful news about the wonderful God is you can know him and you can know him personally and you can know his personality and you can understand how much he loves you. So let's not go to him thinking somehow he's angry with us or he's mean uh, or we haven't followed all the rules or anything like that. Let's come to him believing that he loved us so much that he died for us, that by his stripes, we are healed. He paid the price. We are redeemed. He is pursuing us with an endless love, and he wants us to be with him for all eternity. When you get those facts straight, well, then faith starts to get really easy and so let's get the easy faith that comes from his presence, his love, his ability. Now, we're going to pray, and this is our week of prayer. We've got some prayer requests before us. And here's one that I want total healing of pancreatic cancer. Another one, total healing by body and mind after a stroke. 
financial blessing on my small business. Uh, please pray for new contacts and new clients. Terry, what do you have? Well, this is someone asking for healing from total healing needed after uh, dealing with congestive heart failure and a series of heart attacks. And then someone needing healing for a baby not yet born, but there are complications that have developed. Someone saying, please pray for me to be delivered of depression. And then another, another viewer saying, the Lord's blessing on our foster care ministry and salvation for each of the children. Let's join in prayer. And if you have a prayer need, let's, let's believe God. Mm -hmm. And here's a wonderful verse. If two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done. So Terry and I are going to agree. You agree with us. And let's touch it together and realize God wants to heal. He wants to deliver. He wants to save. All of these are his ideas. And all we have to do is say yes and amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you. We come boldly to the throne of grace. And we just acknowledge you have been pursuing us with an endless love. So we turn and we say, yes, yes. Come in, Lord Jesus. Shower us with your love. Baptize us in your love. And let us know how great your power is to us who believe. So, Lord, for those prayer requests now for the pancreatic cancer, for those who have had strokes, for those who need total body healing, for those that need a financial miracle, for those that need blessing over ministry, over family, for those that need reconciliation, we come into agreement now, touching it, and we say over it, be healed, be delivered from depression, be restored. Let your every need be provided for by the answer to every human need. We receive it now. We receive it from your hand of blessing now. In Jesus' name. Terry, you've got something. Now, there's someone you've been diagnosed with some kind of a condition in your stomach. It has something to do with the lining of your stomach, but it's made life so unpleasant for you. God is healing that condition. You're just going to begin to feel a warmth come through your diaphragm area as God completely heals you. There's someone you're watching in a hospital and you've gone through brain surgery. I just see a, a picture of your uh, the top of your head where it's been... Uh, partially shaved, and I see the stitch marks, and you're just crying out, Lord, deliver me from this. And so we just speak to every tumor and, and just be gone now. Uh, reproduce no more. Let there be complete and total healing of your brain, restoration of your thoughts, your memories. Let everything concerning you be whole now in Jesus' name. Someone else, you've had a, a pinched nerve in your neck and it's caused uh, uh, shooting, numbing pain, and, and God's just healed all of that. Someone else with recurring migraines, uh, there's a sinus condition. God is healing many right now. Just stretch forth your hand. Realize that the kingdom of God is near you now. He is able and willing to heal you now. Just reach up and take it in Jesus' name. Mm. Some of the jaw out of alignment, too, that's just gone into place. You can feel it. You haven't been able to eat without pain for a long time. Just thank the Lord and receive it. Someone else with difficulty swallowing, and there's like a lump on the right side of your uh, voice box, and, and you're really worried about it, and you haven't seen a doctor. Let that lump just disappear now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are the healer, the deliverer, our answer, Lord God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. If you've been healed, if you've been touched by God, share your good report with us. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. Uh, we're here for you every day that ends in Y. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, a former All-American goalkeeper for LSU and the first female ever to try out and train for a Division I men's football team. Now a speaker and best-selling author, Mo Isom, joins us live to talk about sex, Jesus, and the conversations the church forgot.
And welcome back to the 700 Club. Christians around the world will observe an international day of prayer and fasting for North Korea Saturday. It marks the first day of North Korea Freedom Week and aims to raise awareness of human rights abuses in that country. The theme of this year's Freedom Week is Truth Will Set Them Free. The organizers decided on this theme after North Korean defects told them only the truth of the gospel can change the country. You can find out about why the prayer warriors say they're taking on the demonic powers and more about this ongoing effort on the behalf of the North Korean people at CBNNews.com. Operation Blessing is helping to improve the lives of kindergartners in the West Bank. The playground and restroom facilities at Zatara were old and damaged and unsafe for children to use. So Operation Blessing built a new restroom and installed four new sinks for the children so they could practice good hygiene. Operation Blessing's teams also restored the playground with artificial grass swings, a seesaw, and other playground equipment. The children now have a healthier and safer environment to play. You can learn more about what Operation is Blessing by doing by visiting their website. It's ob.org. Gordon and Terry are back with much more of today's 700 Club. That's coming up right after this. Mo Isom was just nine years old when she saw a poker card embellished with pornographic images. She says those images were instantly burned into her memory and ultimately led her to a decades-long porn addiction. For years, Mo excelled as an athlete and was in the media spotlight with her secret addiction well hidden. Take a look. Mo Isom has packed a lot of living into 28 years. As an All-American goalkeeper at Louisiana State University, she holds the all-time school record in women's soccer with 35 victories and 25 shutouts. ESPN honored her for top 10 plays of the week after she kicked a 90-yard goal. Mo was also the first female in the country to try out for and train with an SEC Division I men's football team, the Tigers of LSU. While her athletic accomplishments brought a lot of media attention, her life was challenged with adversity and unexpected tragedy. The moment the three police officers walked into the room my mom, my sister and I were in and told us that they had found my dad's remains, the world froze. After her father's death, Mo was in an automobile accident, which brought her face to face with a God who loved her. And that started a new chapter in her life. In 2013, she became a New York Times best-selling author with her book, Wreck My Life, Journeying from Broken to Bold. Before writing her second book, Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot, Mo married Jeremiah. They have two daughters, Auden and Asher. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Mo Isom. It's great to have you here. It's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. Mo, God has made you powerful, your voice powerful, not just your performance, but your willingness to be brave about things that a lot of people hide because they feel diminished by them. Talk a little bit, if you will. You've been very successful in your life in so many areas. And when it comes to sexual addictions or sexual issues of any kind, there's a lot of shame attached to that. What made you decide to go public with this? Um, for that very reason, I think that the enemy uses sexual sin to shame us into silence. And yet, if you look around our world, around our culture right now, it is one of the greatest issues we are wrestling with. And so my, my confusion comes in, then why are we silent? Yeah. Why, if scripture says, boast in your weaknesses, so you can point to the glory of the cross, why are we not speaking about these struggles and about the freedom that can come in Jesus' name from these things? Which actually sets others free. Exactly. Go back to that nine-year-old time with the, the poker card. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened. I was climbing into my dad's truck and opened the door and he had a lot stuffed behind the seats and some things fell out. And I picked up one of the, the pieces of paper and it was a poker card, but it had pornographic image on the back. 
And it was my first time to see these graphic things. And even being young and not fully understanding, it still seared something in my heart. Mm -hmm. And you would think that we would run from that and you know not want to see it again, but actually quite the opposite happens usually. So it okay. triggered this curiosity in me and kind of this longing to see more, to understand these feelings. And it just led me into the darkness of navigating through um, struggles with wanting to set these things before my eyes. Well, and the poker card is in your daddy's car. How did yeah. this impact your relationship with your dad over the years? Um, really tremendously, yeah. because I then began to see, you know, I'd come into the office where he was on the computer and he'd turn it off mm -hmm. quickly. And we'd come across things at night when I'd come down for a snack and see things that were keeping my father out of the arms of my mommy. Yeah. And that's hard on a young heart. And I became resentful and confused and then even more shame filled because it was things that intrigued me. Mm -hmm. And I saw how it was affecting my parents' marriage and my father's heart, yet we were all silent about it. And I was silently struggling with the very same urges and temptations. And so it, it's just brokenness that breeds brokenness and sin that breeds sin. And you it's know, hard. it's so crazy because I see this in, in kids also when they're very unhappy that their parents say smoke cigarettes mm -hmm. and they throw them out and they cry and then they grow up and they smoke. Right. And so there is a hook in all of this that gets in us. How did this impact your relationships as you grew up, became a young woman and moved into adulthood? You know, porn really began to shape my perspective mm -hmm. of strength and power and beauty and um, what people desire from appeal, women, yeah. appeal. Mm -hmm. And that kind of escorted me, that desensitized view on things, escorted me into acting things out in the same way, into yeah. promiscuity, into seeking others to give me worth and value and affirmation. And when we don't know Christ and we don't know whose yeah. we are and that inherent worth and value that we carry and that he died for to redeem, um, we can we can go down a long and winding trail of struggling. And then, Mo, even after you knew Christ, because it had its hook in you, you still struggled so much with it, which only demeans your your self value in your own head and heart for a right. long time. Right. Yeah. Sexual sin is just has a strong stranglehold on us oftentimes and in many ways and after coming to know christ and after having him free me of this you know struggle with pornography and knowing the power of redemption there still at times when temptation came i chose to choose for myself and and stumbled yet again but the conviction that comes with that when we know the beauty of freedom yet we still walk back into bondage it's it's heavy and um, God had to do a great work in my heart of breaking chains and soul ties and misunderstandings and time. confusion. It took time yeah. and it took a lot of forgiveness and it took a lot of extending myself to ask forgiveness from others. And it took wrestling with and reckoning with these sexual struggles yeah. to truly find freedom because God invites us to participate in yeah. the healing. He invites us to wrestle through these things. I, I want to go back if I can to your childhood, just in the sense that your mom talked about sex as you were growing up. You know, a lot of parents think that's enough. If they just bring up the issues, if they just say you shouldn't do it, bada bum, you know, you're right. done. What didn't she say that she could have that would have made a difference? You know, I, I, I don't fault my mom. She was always very open about these types of conversations, but I was quick to grab onto something. We talked about virginity. And so I grabbed onto virginity and waved it as this proud banner of understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think oftentimes the church will talk a lot about the do's and don'ts, the rights and wrongs and virginity, but we don't carry the conversation further into what God deeply cares about, which is purity, mm -hmm. purity of heart purity in what we set before our eyes and our thoughts and our actions because we are pure vessels that God desires to use. And so when the conversation stops at virginity, mm -hmm. our question becomes, okay, then how far is too far? Yeah. Then what still qualifies me as a virgin? It becomes a works-based answer to a life surrender question. Yeah. God speaks of purity in his word, that he desires purity for our lives. And it also doesn't address what God's purpose and intention for the marriage bed is, because right. there's so much that's skewed in our, our culture today. And you talk in your book about 
uh, becoming one about that holy part of, of sex yes. that was God's plan. Yes, sex is God's invention. It is a gift given to us by God. And he, he, he instructs us in certain and particular ways around it because he knows what is best for us. Sex is an act of worship. It is a weapon against the enemy in marriage. It is a unifying weapon that is so beautiful. But when we are you know, exercising it outside of God's design mm -hmm. and then struggling with the pain and the bondage that that inflicts, we can often carry that sometimes into marriage. And my sister-in-law told me the greatest quote one time. She said, prior to marriage, the enemy will do everything he can to drive you together. And after marriage, the enemy will do everything he can to drive you apart. Well, that's the truth. God's gifts are good and they are holy and they are with great purpose. And I think when we can come to to wrap our hearts and our hands around God's beautiful design, it can save our marriages. It can serve our marriages. It can become something that we operate in um, as husband and wife in great beauty within marriage. And as parents, boy, yes. I just want to say, whether you have struggled with some form of sex addiction or wounding in that area of your life, maybe you're a parent and you're raising kids and you think, how do I protect my kids from what's skewed in the culture today? Mo's book is called Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot, and it's available wherever books are sold. Highly recommend it. By the way, she's also our featured speaker at our new chapel today. We'll be streaming that service live. So again, if you want to join us, go to CBN.com at noon Eastern time. And we'd love to have you be there with us. Thanks, Mo. Great Thank to you. have you here. Thanks Gordon. for having me. Well, up next, meet a 10-year-old who wants to be just like her cartoon hero. Watch how Superbook's Joy teaches this girl to befriend a child being bullied when we come back. Annie is a young girl living in Albania who has a role model. She wants to be loving and kind, just like the character Joy from CBN's series Superbook. Well, Joy has made such a huge impact on her that her mother says it has changed her life. When I was five or six years old, I watched Superbook for the first time. Ten-year-old Enia found a hero in her favorite cartoon series. I am thinking all the time, why can't I become like Joy? She believes in God and she is good and kind. I began to believe and I started to pray. This cartoon changed the life of my daughter. The story of Esther when Joy makes friends with children that others have rejected, it had a strong impact on Anya. Joy in the cartoon walks with a girl named Pony who used a wheelchair. I thought, if Joy can be so kind and brave, so can I. So Enia befriended a child at school who had been bullied by classmates. I found out that she was a nice person, and I realized that all people need to be given a chance. Enia is one of the thousands of children across Albania whose lives have been changed through CBN's Superbook. Albanian missionary Rachel Byler has witnessed the influence of Superbook firsthand. We love the show Superbook in Albania because wherever we go, and this is true, wherever we go, uh, the kids have all know the song, and it's the song of salvation. This cartoon is very important for our country because so many children are in families who don't know Jesus. But now they know Gizmo, Joy and Chris, and they hear about God through them. Now I talk to my friends about Jesus. Thank you to everyone who made the wonderful Superbook. And thank you. If you're part of the Superbook Club, you're part of that. Uh, you're part of sharing the stories of the Bible with the children of the world. We're up to 43 languages on our way to 55 languages, and we're broadcasting these wonderful Bible stories around the world. There's a broadcast map showing all the different broadcast languages that we currently have, uh, and we want it even more. We're still in production on the series. We're uh, getting ready to start season five, uh, and, and you can be a part of it. You can be a part of the production cost, the translation cost, the distribution cost, uh, this wonderful Superbook app and the cost for that. 
You can be a part of all of it by joining the Superbook Club. How much is it? Well, it's $25 a month, and for your gift of $25 or more, we'll send you the latest episode of Superbook. Right now, we've got Joshua and Caleb, that story, the story of the spies uh, going into the promised land. We'll send you not just one copy, we'll send you three copies for your gift of $25 or more. So if you want to be a part of it, if you want to be a part of sharing these wonderful stories, uh, it's amazing the number of children, 180 million children uh, last year, according to our surveys, watched a Superbook episode. And here's the one that really just brings me joy. Over 90 million uh, were uh, singing the salvation poem, which is a prayer for salvation. You could be a part of that by joining the Superbook Club. So if you'd like to, just call us, 1-800-700-7000. Well, here's a word for you from John chapter 16. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And realize God wants your joy to be full. He wants you to ask so that you can receive and give him the glory. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next week. God bless.